Section 9 of the Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. The Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 1, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. Matilda of Scotland, Chapter 2, Part 1. Matilda's English ancestry and English education rendered the new king's marriage with her a most popular measure with the Anglo-Saxon people, of whom the great bulk of his subjects was composed. By then the royal bride was fondly styled Matilda Etheline, and regarded as the representative of their own regretted sovereigns. The allegiance which the mighty Norman conqueror and his despotic son, the Red King, had never been able to obtain except through the sternest measures of compulsion, and which, in defiance of the dreadful penalties of loss of eyes, limbs, and life, had been frequently withdrawn from these powerful monarchs, was freely and faithfully accorded to the husband of Matilda, Henry I, by the Saxon population. All the reforms effected by his enlightened government, and all the good laws which his enlarged views of political economy taught this wise monarch to adopt, were attributed, by his Anglo-Saxon subjects, to the beneficial influence of his young queen. Robert of Gloucester was fully impressed with these ideas, as we may plainly perceive in the following lines in his rhyming chronicle, in which he speaks of Henry's marriage. So that as soon as he was king, on St. Martin's day I ween, he spoused her that was called Maud the good queen, that was kind heir of England, as I have told before. Many were the good laws that were made in England, through Maud the good queen, as I understand. Five and thirty years had elapsed since the metropolis had enjoyed the advantage of a resident court. Matilda of Flanders, during her brief visit to England, held her state at Westminster, the favorite abode of the first two Anglo-Norman monarchs, and the Londoners, whose prosperity had sensibly diminished, in consequence of the entire absence of female royalty, beheld with unfeigned satisfaction the palace of Edward the Confessor, at Westminster, once more graced by the presence of a queen of the blood of Alfred, whose virtues, piety, and learning, rendered her a worthy successor of the last Saxon queen who had held her court there, Editha, that gracious rose of Godwin's thorny stem. Those to whom the memory of that illustrious lady was justly dear, were probably not unmindful of the fact, that the youthful queen, on whom the hopes of England were so fondly fixed, had received that genuine Saxon name at the baptismal font, and though, in compliment of her Norman godfather, she was called Matilda, she was also Editha. Like her saintly predecessor, Matilda fully verified the primitive title bestowed by the Saxon on their queens, Halaftage, or the giver of bread. Her charities were of a most extensive character, and her tender compassion for the sufferings of the sick poor carried her almost beyond the bounds of reason, to say nothing of the restraints imposed on royalty. She imitated the example of her mother, the saintly queen of Scotland, both in the strictness of her devotional exercises, and in her personal attentions to those who were laboring under bodily afflictions. She went every day in Lent to Westminster Abbey, barefoot, and clothed in a garment of haircloth she would wash and kiss the feet of the poorest people, for which, according to Robert of Gloucester, she was once reproved, not without reason, by a courtier. He had his answer, however, as our readers will perceive from the following curious dialogue. Madam, for God's love is this well ado, to handle such unclean limbs, and to kiss so. Foul would the king think of this he wist, and right well avile him, ere he your lips kissed. Sir, sir, quoteth the queen, be still, why say you so? Our lord himself example gave, for to do so. On another occasion, her brother, Alexander the Fierce, king of Scotland, when on a visit to the court of her royal husband, entering Matilda's apartment, found her on her knees, engaged in washing the feet of some aged mendicants on which she entreated him to avail himself of the opportunity of performing a good and acceptable work of charity and humiliation, by assisting her in this labor of love, for the benefit of his soul. 
the warlike majesty of scotland smiled and left the room without making any reply to this invitation perhaps he was conscious of his want of skill as an assistant at a pediluvian party or it might be that he had seen too much of such scenes during the life of his pious mother queen margaret and feared that his sister would carry her works of benevolence to extremes that might prove displeasing to the tastes of so refined a prince as henry beauclerc but to do matilda justice her good works in general bore a character of more extended usefulness so much so that we even feel the benefit of them to this day in the ancient bridge she built over my lady leah once being with her train on horseback in danger of perishing while fording the river leah at old ford during a high flood in gratitude for her preservation she built the first arch bridge ever known in england a little higher up the stream called the saxon's bow bridge still to be seen at stratford le bow though the ancient and mighty london bridge has been broken down bow bridge she built at the head of the town of stratford likewise channels bridge over a tributary stream of the lea the way between them being well paved with gravel she gave certain manors and a mill called wigan mill for ever towards keeping in repair the said bridges and way matilda founded the hospital at st giles in the fields and also christ church which stood on the very spot now called duke's palace noted as the resort of a low class of jews this excellent queen also directed her attention to the important object of making new roads and repairing the ancient highways that had fallen into decay during the stormy years which had succeeded the peaceful and prosperous reign of her great uncle edward the confessor by this means travellers and itinerant merchants were greatly facilitated in their journeys through the then wild and perilous country which with the exception of the four great roman ways was only intersected by a few scattered cart tracks through desolate moors heaths and uncultivated wastes and woodlands these public benefits which matilda the good conferred upon the people from whose patriotic monarch she derived her descent were in all probability the fruits of her regency during the absence of her royal husband in normandy for it is scarcely to be supposed that such stupendous undertakings could have been effected by the limited power and revenues of a mere queen consort henry the first be it remembered was placed on the throne by the saxon division of his subjects who were the commons of england and by them he was supported in his regal authority against the norman aristocracy who formed a powerful party in favor of his elder brother's pretensions to the crown of england the moral and political reforms with which henry commenced his reign and above all the even-handed measure of justice which he caused to be observed towards all who presumed to infringe the laws gave great offence to many of those haughty nobles who had been accustomed to commit the most flagrant crimes with impunity and to oppress their humbler neighbors without fear of being arraigned for their misdeeds the establishment of the equitable laws which protected the wives and daughters of englishmen from insult the honest trader from wrong and robbery and the poor from violence were attributed to the influence of matilda whom they insultingly styled the saxon woman and murmured at the virtuous restraints which her presence and authority imposed upon the court the conjugal affection which subsisted between the royal pair excited withal the ridicule of those who had been the profligate associates of the bachelor king william rufus and it was universally displeasing to the haughty norman peers to see the king's gracious demeanor towards the hitherto oppressed and dispirited english portion of his subjects for whom his amiable consort was constantly laboring to procure a recognition of their rights the malice of certain evil-minded men says edmer busied itself in inventing the most cutting railleries on king henry and his wife of english blood they nicknamed them leofric and godiva and always called them so when not in the royal presence it is probable that warren the disappointed suitor of matilda and his kinsman mortimer with others of the audacious norman quens who had previously exercised their wit in bestowing an offensive sobriquet on henry before his ascension to the throne were among the foremost of those invidious detractors who could not endure to witness the wedded happiness of their sovereign and the virtuous influence of his youthful queen the invasion of duke robert henry's eldest brother on his return from the holy land took place in the second year of matilda's marriage 
King Henry's fleet being manned with Norman seamen, and, of course, under the influence of Norman chiefs, revolted, and, instead of guarding the coasts of England from the threatened invasion of the Duke, swept across the narrow seas, and brought him and his armament in triumph to Portsmouth, where he was joined by the majority of the Anglo-Norman baronage. Robert had also his partisans among the English, for Edgar Etheline so far forgot the interests of his royal niece, Queen Matilda, as to espouse the cause of his friend Robert against the king, her husband. Robert landed at Portsmouth, and marched direct to Winchester, where Queen Matilda lay in with her first-born child, William the Etheline. When this circumstance was related to the duke, he relinquished his purpose of storming the city, with the observation, that it should never be said, he commenced the war by an assault on a woman in childbed, for that would be a base action. Matilda duly appreciated this generous consideration, on the part of her royal brother-in-law and godfather, and exerted all her influence to negotiate a peace between him and her lord, in which she was assisted by the good offices of the Archbishop Anselm, and this formidable crisis passed over without the effusion of a drop of blood. These are Harding's words on the subject. But Anselm, Archbishop of Canterbury, and Queen Matilda made them well accord, the king to pay three thousand marks yearly to Duke Robert, without in more discord. After this happy pacification, Henry invited Robert to become his guest at the court, where the easy-tempered duke was feasted and entertained, greatly to his satisfaction, by his royal goddaughter Matilda, who, in her love of music, and the encouragement she bestowed on minstrels, or trouviers, quite coincided with the taste of her sponsor and brother-in-law. For, says Malmesbury, every poet hastened to the court of Matilda, to read his verses to that queen, and to partake of her bounty. So much did Robert enjoy his sojourn at Henry's court, that he stayed there upwards of six months, though his presence was greatly required in his own dominions. An unfortunate misunderstanding took place between Henry and the Archbishop Anselm, early in the year 1103. This quarrel originated in an attempt made by the Archbishop to deprive the king of a privilege, which had been claimed by the Saxon monarchs, of appointing his own bishops. Anselm wished to restore the nomination of the chapters, which Henry resolutely opposed. Both appealed to the Pope, but Anselm went to Rome, to plead his own cause against the king's three advocates, and remained in exile. The following year, Robert revisited England, either to demand payment of his pension, or to raise a revolt. He was, however, attended by only twelve gentlemen. Henry, having speedy information of his landing, declared, if he fell into his hands, he would keep him so closely imprisoned, that he should never give him any more trouble. Not so, sire, replied the Count de Malent. He is your brother, and God forbid that you should do so great a villainy. Let me meet and talk with him, and I will take care that he shall return quietly into Normandy, and give you a quittance of his pension withal. By my faith, replied the king, I will make you do what you say. The count then mounted his horse, and encountering Duke Robert on the road to Southampton, greeted him with these words, St. Mary, what brings you into this country? Who has given you such fatal counsel? You know you have hitherto compelled the king to pay you four thousand marks a year, and for this cause you will be taken and put to death, or detained in prison for life. He is determined to avenge on you, I promise you. When the duke heard this he was greatly disturbed, and asked, If he could not return to Southampton? No, replied Mellant, the king will cause you to be intercepted, but even if you could reach that place, the wind is contrary for your escape by sea. Counsel me, cried the duke, what I ought to do. Sire, replied the count, the queen is apprised of the news, and you know that you showed her great kindness when you gave up the assault on Winchester, because she lay in childbed there. Hasten to her, and commit yourself and your people to her care, and I am sure she will guard you from all harm. Then Duke Robert went to the queen, and she received and reassured him very amiably, and by the sweet words she said to him, and the fear he was in of being taken, he was induced to sacrifice those pecuniary claims on the king his brother, for which he had resigned the realm of England. When Henry heard that his brother, 
had granted an acquaintance for this money to the queen, he sent to the queen, to come to him with Duke Robert. Matilda brought the duke to the king, and the duke thus addressed him. Fair sire, I am come to see you out of affection, and not to injure either you or yours. We are brothers, born of one father and one mother. If I am the eldest, you have the honor of a crown, which is a much better thing. I love you well, and thus it ought to be. Money and rents I seek not of you, nor ever will. I have quitted to the queen all you owe me for this kingdom. Enter we now together into perfect amity. We will exchange gifts of jewels, dogs, and birds, with such things as ought to be between brothers and friends. We will do as you say, replied the king, and thanks for what you have said. The Saxon chronicler and some other historians affirm, indeed, that he invaded England. But it is plain, says Sir John Hayward, that he only came for disport and play, that is, to recreate himself at the court of Henry Beauclerc, and to enjoy the agreeable society of the queen his goddaughter, with the music and minstrelsy in which they both so greatly delighted. Well would it have been for the luckless Robert, if all his tastes had been equally harmless and refined, but he had propensities disgraceful to his character as an individual, and ruinous to his fortunes as a prince. The chroniclers relate that he indulged in such excessive revelry, while he was at the English court, that he was often in a state of inebriation for days together. According to some historians, Robert resigned his pension to Matilda at a carouse, and when he became aware of the folly of which he had been guilty, he was greatly exasperated, and bitterly reproached his brother Henry, with having cheated and despoiled him, by employing the queen to beguile him with fair words out of his pension, when he was under the influence of wine. There was nothing but animosity between the royal brothers, after this affair. Robert's indignation at the trick he had been played, led him to make use, not only of reproaches, but menaces against Henry, who availed himself of that excuse to make war upon him. In the year 1104, Henry left the government of England in the prudent hands of Matilda, and embarked for Normandy. While there, he consented to meet Anselm, the archbishop, at the castle La Glee, where, through the mediation of his sister Adela, Countess of Blois, a reconciliation was happily effected. Anselm then returned to England, where he was met at Dover by the Queen Matilda, who received and welcomed him with the greatest demonstrations of satisfaction. As the venerable primate was in feeble health, the Queen took the precaution of preceding him on the road from Dover to the metropolis, providing as she went, for his comforts and accommodation. Matilda, independently of the feeling of political expediency, which rendered this public testimonial of respect to the archbishop desirable, after the unpopular schism between him and her royal husband, was, in all probability, naturally inclined to testify her regard for a person who had been so actively instrumental in raising her to the exalted station which she then enjoyed. Yet the return of Anselm was attended with circumstances which gave great pain to Matilda, as an English queen. Both the king and archbishop, after their reconciliation, united in enforcing inexorably the celibacy of the Anglo-Saxon clergy, whose lower orders had previously been able to obtain licenses to marry. Anselm now excommunicated all the married clergy. Two hundred of these unfortunate Saxons, barefoot, but clad in their clerical robes, encountered the king and queen in the streets of London. They implored the king's compassion. He turned from them with words of insult. They then supplicated the queen to intercede for them, but Matilda, with tears in her eyes, assured them that she dared not interfere. The year 1104 was marked by the birth of a princess, who was first named Alice, or Adelaide, but whose name the king afterwards changed to that of his beloved and popular queen, Matilda. This princess was afterwards the celebrated empress Matilda. Some writers, on the authority of Gervasius, the monk of Canterbury, assert that she was the first-born child of Henry and Matilda. But the fact that Prince William was eighteen at the time when the fatal loss of the white ship deprived England of her heir apparent, in the year 1120, makes it evident that he was the eldest of the two. It has been said that Matilda placed her little daughter, 
for education and nurture in the royal abbey of wilton where she had herself completed her studies the profound tranquillity that subsisted in her husband's dominions during his frequent absences in normandy is a proof that matilda understood the art of domestic government and practiced it with a happier effect than the two first anglo-norman sovereigns whose reigns were so greatly disturbed by insurrections henry after his successful campaign in normandy returned to england in his personal appearance at least an altered man the anglo-normans had adopted the picturesque saxon fashion which however was confined to persons of high rank of wearing their hair long and flowing in ringlets on their shoulders and the king was remarkable for the luxuriance and beauty of his love locks which he cherished with peculiar care no doubt out of a laudable desire to conform to the tastes of his queen the daughter of a saxon princess his courtiers imitated the royal example which gave great scandal to the norman clergy one day while the king was in normandy he and his train entered a church where an ecclesiastic of the name of serlo bishop of sees took up his parable on the sinfulness of this new fashion which he protested was a device of the evil one to bring souls into everlasting perdition compared the mustached bearded and long-haired men of that age to filthy goats and in short made so moving a discourse on the unloveliness of their present appearance that the king of england and his courtiers melted into tears on which sir lo perceiving the impression which his eloquence had made drew a pair of scissors out of his sleeve and instead of permitting their penitents to evaporate in a few unmeaning drops persuaded his royal and noble auditors to prove the sincerity of their repentance by submitting their ringlets to his discretion and brought his triumph to a climax by polling the king and congregation with his own hands henry was then courting popularity in the duchy of normandy and well knew that the readiest way to effect his object was to win the good report of the monks he had previously scandalized all piously disposed persons by choosing for his private chaplain a priest whose only merit consisted in being able to hurry over matins and mass in half an hour this was roger le Poer, afterwards the rich and potent bishop of salisbury whose hasty dispatch of the morning service so charmed henry that he swore aloud in the church that he had at length met with a priest fit for a soldier roger when he received this flattering commendation from the lips of royalty was only a poor curate at cain but was advanced by henry to the highest preferment in the church and state after henry had submitted his flowing ringlets to the reforming shears of sir lo he published an edict compelling his lieges to relinquish these sinful adornments also matilda did not long enjoy the society of her royal husband in england and during the brief period he spent with her at northampton in the winter season his whole time and thoughts were employed in raising the means for pursuing the war in normandy his unfortunate brother robert finding himself sorely pressed on every side and left by his own improvident folly without resources for continuing the contest came over to england unattended and repairing to the court at northampton forced an interview with henry who was reluctant to admit him into his presence and earnestly besought his compassion telling him at the same time he was ready to submit everything to his brotherly love if he would only permit him to retain the appearance of a sovereign as it by no means suited henry's policy to yield to the dictates of natural affection he coldly turned away muttering something to himself that was unintelligible to the bystanders and which he could not be induced to explain robert's quick temper could not brook this contemptuous usage and in a paradoxum of rage he indignantly assailed his younger brother with a storm of reproaches mingled with abuse and menaces and without waiting to employ the good offices of queen matilda through whose kindly influence it is possible he might have obtained reasonable conditions of peace he departed from northampton the same hour in the spring henry once more committed the domestic affairs of his kingdom to the care of matilda and having levied an enormous tax on his subjects to support the expenses of the war embarked for normandy matilda was principally employed during the king's absence in superintending the magnificent buildings at new windsor which were founded by henry and in the completion of the royal apartments in the tower of london 
she as well as henry patronized gundolf the episcopal architect to whom england is indebted for the most magnificent and lasting of her public buildings many useful public works to which we have before alluded furnished under her auspices employment for the working classes and improved the general condition of the people while civilization and the arts of peace were rapidly progressing through the beneficial influence of matilda at home the arms of her royal consort were universally triumphant in normandy the unfortunate robert courthose with his young son william who was called clito or royal heir with the earl of montaigne and all the nobles of their party were taken prisoners at the decisive battle of tinchebray which was fought on the vigil of st michael exactly forty years after the famous battle of hastings the english were much elated at this circumstance whereby they flattered their national pride with the idea that the husband of their beloved queen of saxon lineage had wiped away the dishonor of the norman conquest by subjugating normandy to the yoke of england edgar etheline matilda's uncle was taken fighting for his friend robert of normandy besides four hundred valiant knights henry instantly released the aged prince for love of the queen his niece say some of the chroniclers of that period and at her intercession settled a pension upon him for life henry now at the summit of his ambition having verified the deathbed prediction of his father the conqueror that he should unite in his own person the inheritance of both his brothers returned triumphantly to england with his unfortunate captives robert was sent to cardiff castle where for a time his confinement was only a sort of honorable restraint at least if we may credit the account which henry himself gives of it in a letter to the pope as follows i have not says he imprisoned him as an enemy but i have placed him in a royal castle as a noble stranger broke down with many troubles and i supply him abundantly with every delicacy and enjoyment henry and matilda kept their easter this year at bath and during the summer introduced the popular custom of making a royal progress through different parts of england the following year henry and matilda kept court for the first time at new windsor then called from the picturesque winding of the river thames windlesore this beautiful retreat was originally used as a hunting seat by william the conqueror who for better security of his person converted it into a fortress or castle but the extensive alterations and improvements which the elegant tastes of the beauclerk sovereign and his accomplished consort matilda of scotland effected first gave to windsor castle the magnificent and august character as a royal residence which has rendered it ever since a favorite abode with succeeding sovereigns in the year eleven o eight the affairs of normandy required the presence of the king another temporary separation took place between matilda and her royal lord indeed from the time that the duchy of normandy was subjected to his sway it became a matter of necessity in order to preserve his popularity with his continental subjects to pass a considerable portion of his time among them meanwhile the peace and integral prosperity of england were best promoted by the presence of matilda who formed the bond of union between henry of normandy and the saxon race therefore it appears to have been a measure of political expediency for her to remain with her splendid court at westminster or london endearing herself daily more and more to the people by her works of princely charity and the public benefits which she was constantly laboring to promote thus we see on accurate examination that contrary to the assertions of one or two paradoxical writers who have assumed that matilda was not treated with the affection and respect that were her due in wedded life she enjoyed a degree of power and influence in the state perfectly unknown to the saxon queens matilda was so nobly dowered withal that in after reigns the highest demand ever made on the part of a queen consort was that she should be endowed with a dower equal to that of matilda of scotland by close examination of the earliest authorities we find that the first parliaments held by the anglo-norman dynasty were the fruits of the virtuous influence of this excellent queen over the mind of her husband but as the fact that parliaments were ever held before the reigns of henry the third and edward the first has been a point of great contest among the modern historians we feel it indispensable to bring forward our proofs first that parliaments were held 
and next, that they were held through the influence of Matilda. The earliest historian who wrote in English, Robert of Gloucester, declares of Henry I. When his daughter was ten years old, to council there he drew, on Whit Sunday, a great parliament he name, held, at Westminster Noble Eno, that much folk came. The other fact is proved by Piers of Langtoft, a parallel historian, who wrote in French, and, with the most minute detail, points out the classes of whom Matilda advised Henry to take counsel, namely, barons, lords of towns, and burgesses. Here are the lines. Maud the good queen gave him in counsel, to love all his folks and leave all his turpilet, disputing, to bear him with his barons that held of him their fees, fiefs, and to lords of towns and burgesses of cities, through counsel of Dame Maud, a kind woman and true. Instead of hatred old, there now was love all new. Now they love full well the barons and the king. The king does ilk a deal at their bidding. Robert of Gloucester, from first to last, speaks of Queen Matilda as an active agent in the government of England, and the restorer and upholder of the Saxon form of legislature, whose system was that of a representative constitution. He says, the goodness that King Henry and the good Queen Mould did to this land nay may never be told. End of section 9